Welcome back to another episode of 40 Facts About the 40K Universe. I am your host, Gersh One, and today we're going to be talking about the Sons of Dorne. If you're new to the channel, subscribe. We post Warhammer 40K lore videos every single day. And what makes this chapter so unique and so awesome is that it started out as a homebrew chapter. Uh, Games Workshop actually ran a competition. Uh, they wanted you to paint and create the lore to a Space Marine chapter. The winners would have their chapter chapter uh, become canon in Warhammer 40k lore, and this chapter was created by Tyler Mangal. Uh, it's an amazing chapter, um, and it just it's full of really good inspirational lore uh, if you're creating your own uh, homebrew chapter. So use this as inspiration to, you know, really beef up your lore around your Space Marine chapter. But with that said, let's get into 40 facts on the Sons of Dorne. The Sons of Dorne is a Loyalist Codex Astarte compliant Space Marine chapter and a successor chapter of the Imperial Fists. The Sons of Dorne's primarily wear black power armor, the Aquila or Imperialis on the chest guard, the faceplate, shoulder plate trim, gauntlets and knee guards are white. The battle brothers of this chapter are known to carefully inscribe intricate scroll work and blessed prayers to the Emperor in High Gothic script upon the ceramite surface of their battle plate. The Sons of Dorne's chapter badge is a white clenched fist similar in the style of the chapter iconography of the Imperial Fist, superimposed on a red roundlet centered on a field of black. The Sons of Dorne were founded in the 34th millennium during an unknown founding using genetic legacies of the Imperial Fist Primarch Robo Dorne. Members of the Crimson Fist chapter were chosen as the representatives of the Adeptus Astarte to help form their newly founded chapter. The Sons of Dorne were given feudal rights to Archaea by the High Lords of Terra to serve as their chapter planet, the home of their fortress monastery and the source of their aspirants. The early exploits of the Sons of Dorne were not known outside of their home sector for nearly a century until their second chapter master, Polis Lucius Alexandros, known by some as Alexandros the Great, rose to prominence. Coming from humble origins, Alexandros was the first chapter master of the Sons of Dorne to have been born on Archaea, and therefore became the first chapter master to descend from the honored families or lineages of the Archean nobility. He became renowned for leading his fleeting chapter on a massive crusade across two segmentums and into the Eye of Terror itself. Over the course of six Terran centuries, Alexandros led the Sons of Dorne in a reconquest of many formal imperial worlds, freeing them from the clutches of heretics, the Apostates and the Xenos. But this great conquest occurred near the Eye of Terror. Alexandros could not rest knowing that the enemies of the Emperor continually assailed mankind. He was forever seeking opportunities to lead his chapter on a campaign. As a result, the Sons of Dorne were rarely at full strength, though what they lacked in number was more than compensated in their determined fever. Several sectors adjacent to the Eye of Terror were ultimately brought back into the Imperial fold by the actions of the chapter. These sectors fell under the protection of the Sons of Dorne. A contingent drawn from the chapter continuously guards this feudal land to the present day. Alexandros continued to lead his chapter for almost 600 standard years before he was brought low by a Chaos Champion's plague weapon that dripped with the foul pestilence of Nurgle. Instead of succumbing to the virulent plague, that infected and ravaged his body, he managed to survive for several more months before the disease finally broke down his genetically enhanced Astarte immune system. His body was interned within a stasis sarcophagus and sequestered within the vaults of the sacred chamber of the Temple of Resilience, located in the chapter's fortress monastery. Some within the chapter whisper that the chapter master lies there waiting until such times as a definitive cure for his illness can be discovered. On that day, his sarcophagus will be open and Alexandros the Great will stride forth once more to lead his battle brothers to glorious battle. 
The Sons of Dorne's chapter homeworld of Archaea is a lush, temperate world with a global climate very similar to that of Terran's ancient Mediterranean region. It has some very large land masses, but the majority of its land area is made up of numerous island chains. It is a feudal world that never progressed far beyond a pre-industrial state, and most advanced technology is reserved for the larger cities and the ruling elite. Though the planet is dotted with several large cities and its primary covered by small townships and farming villages. Of course, each of these is usually dominated by a sprawling villa belonging to some member of the partition or noble class. The cities are described by many imperial visitors as being both majestic and breathtaking. The neoclassical architecture of this world is very similar to that of Macrag or the ancient Romani of Terra. Built mostly of white marble, the Archaeans constructed monuments involving both architectural and engineering skills, including vast edifices such as bridges, aqueducts, amphitheaters, and triumphant arches, as well as temples and palaces for the partitions. Archaea was once considered a world of beauty, with its rolling hills, crystal clear seas, deep luscious forest, and majestic cities. However, almost all of this is now nothing more than fond memory, after the world was ravaged by a splinter fleet of High Fleet Leviathan. The world has been left barren and desolate with only a few barely inhabited cities remaining. Only a small, defense force of Astartes remained to protect the chapter homeworld when the Tyranids came, for most of the chapter had left to prowl the stars to seek out and battle the enemies of mankind in their newly gifted space fortresses. Our chaos is a hierarchical and class conscious society, but there is always the possibility of movement between the socio-economical classes because class is no longer determined solely by birth. For the most part, Archaean society is described as a republic, although the Sons of Dorne themselves are known to take direct control of the state in times of national emergency or when absolutely necessary. Family lines, so-called lineages, play a very important part within the Archaean society, extending even into the culture of the chapter itself. Archaean culture has often been described as being very similar to that of ancient Terran Renaissance during the mid-2nd millennium, with the wealth dispersed throughout much of society except for the very poorest of the free men and the class of indentured servants who serve the partitions. The planetary government is located in the Archaean capital city of Capuas, a city described by the prominent traveling scholar Danius Amnus as one of 1,500 wonders of the Segmentum Solar. Its streets spiral out from a central courtyard or forum which houses the mansions of its wealthiest citizens and the soaring ivory towers of the political sector. Every building is carved out of marble and inlaid with intricate reliefs and sculptures dedicated to heroic battles from the Sons of Dorne's history, alongside many of the world's mightiest heroes. A popular attraction for its citizens and visitors is the Gladium, a towering amphitheater which is home to brutal displays of vicious combat. Often criminals or slaves are tested in the Gladium by being thrown in against vicious chrono gladiators, favored champions, or sometimes even Astarte warriors. The latter usually only participate in order to fend off boredom, hone their battle skills, or punish those they see as being particularly unworthy. However, on occasion, an Astarte will be thrown into the gladium as punishment for some failed task. He is stripped of his rank, his power armor, his war gear, and most terrible of all, his name, and thus his lineage. If he survives for a certain number of games and shows proper penance for his failure, he will be allowed to rejoin the chapter with his rank and honor intact. While in the gladium, or the pits, as members of the chapter refer to it, Astartes are shown no favoritism and are mercilessly harassed by the baying crowds and shunned by their society until they can once again prove their worth. 
Like their fellow Imperial Fist successor chapters, the Sons of Dorne venerate the Emperor of Mankind as the gene father of the Adeptus Astarte. Though not as a god, and Rogel Dorn as the Primarch of the Imperial Fist Legion, and thus their own founder. As a chapter of Space Marines recruited from a single planet, each battle brother of the Sons of Dorn shares a common cultural bond. Lineages play a key role in the society of Archaea, and the Sons of Dorn themselves. It is a matter of great pride and honor for an Astarte of this chapter to say he descends from an ancient Arcanian lineage. Where most Space Marine chapters try to distance their battle brothers from their lives prior to being inducted, the Sons of Dorne strongly encourage and maintain the family ties. It is not uncommon for a great grandfather, uncles, cousins, and even brothers to serve amongst the chapter's ranks. The only relation not allowed is that of a father and son, as it is deemed too strong an influence that could break down the chapter's formal bond of authority. Usually a father would have to be inducted into the ranks before his son was ever born. This can lead to the son believing there can be a possibility of a relationship being formed with a father that he has no wishes to partake in beyond the honor of a shared lineage. Due to the same family name being possessed by many Astartes in the same company, sometimes even in the same squad, it is a custom to address the battle brothers of the chapter only by their first names. This is only allowed within the chapter's ranks, and it is a terrible insult for a son of Dorn Astarte to be addressed this way by an outsider. There are fears amongst other chapters that this is a practice that could lead to nepotism, but this has never occurred. In fact, the most famous Archaean lineage, that of Alexandros, has many of his descendants inducted into the chapter of Space Marines, but they have never passed above the rank of the common battle brother. However, the chapter's two most famous Astartes were both of the same lineage and both rose to the rank of chapter master. They played vital roles within the chapter's history, something that many rival chapters are quick to point out when the Sons of Dorn claim that their strong family ties have played no part in the governance of their chapter. The Sons of Dorn follow the Codex Astarte in all matters of organization, with one exception. The chapter's number of apothecaries far exceeds the number of normal present in a single chapter. The Sons of Dorne are renowned for their advanced medical practices, which focus on disease and how to best combat it. The Apothecarium of the Chapter's Fortress Monastery is vast and houses some of the most deadly strains of diseases known to man. These samples are used for study in the hopes of finding vaccines to best combat them and further strengthen the immune system of all space marines. The Plague of Unbelief and the Destroyer Hive are the two deadliest warp touch strains currently possessed by the chapter. The apothecaries have worked for millennia to find cures to these horrendously powerful and virulent strains, but so far they have not succeeded. While the Sons of Dorne do have a homeworld and a fortress monastery, for the most part they are a fleet based crusading chapter and although they follow the tenets of the Codex Astarte in their basic pattern of organization and order of battle, in practice the chapter has modified its tenets to better suit the needs and patterns of their deployments. An example of this is the chapter's company captains and other senior ranking officers are also assigned flag command of a particular starship in the chapter's fleet and are expected to act autonomously of higher authority for long periods if needed. The chapter's veteran first company, called the Praetorians, and the elements of the 10th Scout Company are nominally based on their chapter's mobile fortress, with a majority of their number being dispersed as needed to individual commands, which can vary considerably in size and operational requirements. As a fleet-based chapter, the Sons of Dorn are rarely gathered en masse except at the commencement of a major crusade called by the chapter master. Most often, the forces of the chapter are dispersed to multiple task forces which are deployed to various expeditions and war zones spreading all over the galaxy. 
One of the traits required of aspirants for full initiation into the chapter is to be infected by a particularly powerful strain of disease held within the chapter's apothecarium. In reality, it is impossible for a non-Astarte to actually survive, but this is not expected. The aspirant must show that he can instinctively accept his fate and place his trust in the Emperor and the chapter's Primarch, Rogel Dorn, thus proving that he can master his fear in the face of imminent death, as all Space Marines must do. If the aspirant can do this and survive for his predetermined amount of time, he is administered the vaccine and considered ready to begin the process of being implanted with his gene seed organs. Due to this and other highly unorthodox and dangerous training practices, the Sons of Dorn have developed an extreme resilience to most form of diseases, even for Astartes. The final test for a neophyte after he has completed the biological transformation into an Astarte, but before becoming a full member of the chapter, is to learn the terrible secret of the treachery and betrayal of the former chapter master Alexandros, the Mad that resulted in the chapter war that nearly destroyed the Sons of Dorn. The newly inducted Battle Brother is obligated to make a sacred pledge upon the chapter's honor to guard his most terrible of secrets with their very lives, taking binding oaths of loyalty more terrible than those usually sworn by the average Astarte. Unlike other chapters that may possess a dark past or some terrible secret, the Sons of Dorns do not go out of their way to conceal this information from their junior brethren. Instead, they embrace this dark secret as a part of their heritage and birthright, for their greatest purpose is to rid the galaxy of the madness of Alexandros the Mad and his fellow renegades. Though a noble and proud chapter, the Sons of Dorn are not without sin, for within their long and glorious history, a dark stain upon their honor still resonates from the time it occurred, over five millennia ago. One of their own, from a proud lineage of their greatest chapter heroes, plunged the Sons of Dorn into a terrible conflict that nearly resulted in their destruction. Although most of the imperial records of this dark time, known as the Age of Apostasy, has been purged, evidence remains that it was through the reviled Alexandros the Mad that the chapter war was birthed. Apius Flavius Alexandros was born to a famous Archean lineage of Alexander the Great. He was the first Alexandros descendant who would rise within the ranks of the Sons of Dorn and play a very pivotal role within the chapter's history, though his legacy of madness would taint the chapter forever. He would be known by future generations of the Sons of Thorn as Alexandros the Mad, a name which would be vilified within the chapter's lore, synonymous with infamy and treachery, and in time would hopefully be erased from history altogether. Apius was one of the first inductees of the great lineage of Alexandros to rise above the station of a mere battle brother and through his numerous deeds of valor and courage, he would be elected from amongst his fellow company commanders as a prospective master of the Sons of Dorn, upon the death of their old chapter master. He was an exceptional warrior without peer in the chapter. Apius underwent the final trial to become a chapter master by ritually ingesting some of the forebearer's poisoned blood in the secret ritual used to choose a worthy successor. Surviving this ordeal, Apius's body appeared to overcome the potent toxins, and he was deemed worthy to lead the chapter. At first, Apius appeared to be an inspirational and formidable leader, cut from the same cloth as his famous ancestor. However, unbeknownst to his brothers, the poisoned blood of Alexandros the Great had an adverse effect on Apius. It is not known whether this was due to some latent effect within the toxic blood of Alexandros the Great. The fact that Apius was a blood descendant of Alexandros' lineage, and was therefore affected more severely by the toxin, or some warp spawn touch from that disease. Perhaps it was a combination of all three, but what is known is that after the ritual ingestion of the blood, changes were quickly brought upon the unsuspecting Apius. Over a short period of time, he began to slip into madness. The changes in his character were subtle and not noticeable by many of his brothers at first. 
This madness would be the catalyst that would eventually lead the chapter into outright heresy. During the Wars of Apostasy in the 36th millennium, Chapter Master Apius ordered his chapter to withdraw from the ongoing conflict with High Lord Goge Van Dyer's apostate forces and return to their homeworld of Archaea. He claimed that they needed to further strengthen their chapter's might in preparation for what surely to be a long and brutal campaign, but this was a lie, for the chapter would play no further role in the intercene conflict nor would they take part in the glorious final assault on Terra against the Mad High Lord's fortress and witness the final successful outcome. Apius wished to fully exploit the economic power of the surrounding sector to his chapter's advantage, increasing the Sons of Dorne's stockpile of arms and equipment far beyond the possible operational needs of a single Space Marine chapter. What he planned to do with this massive stockpile is not known, but Imperial scholars believe that he was preparing to launch his own dark crusade of plunder across the reaches of the Segmentum Solar. During this period of reconsolidation and preparation, Apius began to show the development of latent psychic abilities. This was highly unusual as he had been thoroughly examined both physically and psychically and had exhibited no natural psychic talents upon his induction into the chapter. After much studies by the chapter's senior librarians, the general consensus was that the tainted blood of Apius's ancestor must have somehow unlocked the psychic potential within him. This development greatly worried many of the Battle Brothers within the chapter and made them wary of their new commander. During this time, a previously unknown advisor rose to prominence within the chapter master Apius's court. This mysterious figure even within his own chapter, wore the colors of the Sons of Dorne, and claimed to have been a member of the chapter, though strangely, most of his battle brothers could not recall who he was. He claimed to have known him from before his rise within the ranks, though these claims were dubious at best. To this day, the identity of this so-called advisor has not been determined. There is some speculation that he was either a demon-possessed psyker or warp creature given the form of an Astarte. Soon, a significant rift formed within the ranks of the Sons of Dorne, as the chapter split into two camps, those that were unswervingly loyal to their new chapter master, and those that could not bring themselves to trust Apius's increasingly suspected judgment. Apius's madness began to degenerate further, as he declared to the chapter that he would no longer be referred to as Apius, for he had casted off his old name. He ordained that he would be referred to as Alexandros in honor of his ancestor's namesake. This action pushed those who did not trust his commander further away. Apius's detractors soon referred to their apparent insane chapter master as Alexandros the Mad, as he had become more self-absorbed, angry, and hate-filled. He indulged in base debauchery, including drunken rivalry and illegal gladiatorial contests, held within his court between his loyal Astarte followers and condemned Archaean criminals. His loyal followers did the same, indulging in every base desire and killing those that displeased them on a whim. Alexandros the Mad was soon accused of killing for mere amusement, deliberately wasting the planet's financial resources to erect statues of himself in Kapua's central forum, amongst Archaeans, heroes, and causing needless starvation amongst his people. During one horrible act that occurred during the games at the Gladium in which he was presiding, he ordered his honor guard to throw an entire section of the crowd into the arena during intermission to be eaten alive by animals because there were no criminals to be prosecuted and he was bored. Other additional tales of insanity tell of Alexandros sending his space marines on illegal military exercises and turning the Sons of Dorne's Fortress Monastery into a brothel, though the validity of this later tale is debatable. Frustrated and greatly disturbed by the chapter master's disreputable action, a cabal composed of some of the chapter's senior officers banded together and demanded an audience with Alexandros the Mad. They refused to follow his commands henceforth and loudly rebuted him, declaring that he was unfit to lead his chapter and ordered him to step down from his role as a chapter master. He and his followers would be stripped of their war gear and put in chains, 
they would be judged by a conclave of their peers who would determine their fate. The bored Alexandros stifled a yawn and merely laughed at this jest. He then rose from his bronze throne and flayed the usurper's soul from their bodies with his psychic might. This final act of treachery damned the chapter master and soon the chapter erupted into outright civil war. During the course of this conflict, there were those that had initially followed the chapter master out of blind loyalty, but realizing their error in judgment, switched sides and vigorously opposed their treacherous brethren. In the end, Alexandros the Mad and less than 200 of his loyal followers fled the wrath of their brethren in a stolen striker cruiser. The rest of the chapter attempted to give chase, but the traitor managed to elude them and reached the safety of the Eye of Terror where they were welcomed into the embrace of the forces of chaos. To this day, this dark stain on the chapter's honor is a closely guarded secret. No one outside the chapter knows of this conflict. The Sons of Dorne enacted an Edict of Obliteration, erasing decades from their chapter's records during this period. Alexandros the Mad and his renegade band of Chaos Space Marines have plagued mankind ever since. And whenever there is a sight of this infamous band, the chapter does everything in its power to dispatch a strike force to investigate. But the insane former chapter master continues to elude his brethren. Despite his madness, Alexandros the Mad still displays the skills and innate abilities of a masterful Astarte leader, set to rival the heroes of a bygone age. His tactical genius is such that he can still outwit even other Space Marine commanders on the field of battle, as a handful of confrontations he has had with the Sons of Dorne have continued to prove. Further reports insinuate that the Mad Chapter Master has fully given himself over to the worship of the ruinous powers. His warband has repainted their armor a glossy black, covering the Imperial heritage, and now sports the accoutrements and damned iconography of chaos. The former chapter master is said to sport a large pair of ebon-colored leathery wings upon his back, appearing as some dark parody of an actual angel, a mutational gift of the dark gods. After Alexandro the Mad's fall from grace, the chapter's librarians fell into a deep trance and gleaned a prophecy from the strange currents of fate. This prophecy foretold the coming of a warrior who would someday rise to command the Sons of Dorne, another Astarte born of the lineage of Alexandros the Great, who would be the polar opposite of Alexandros the Mad, and who would one day face the chapter's nemesis and end his madness. After the corruption of Alexandros the Mad and the violence that followed, a conclave was formed to determine the chapter's future. There was some reluctance on the part of some of the senior Astartes to allow another prospective successor from the lineage of Alexandros to ever be allowed to drink from the poisoned blood, but eventually a consensus was reached. They would not restrict any prospective successor in accordance with Alexandros the Great's wishes, but would place closer scrutiny upon every future inheritor of the chapter master's mantle. The chapter's senior reclusiarch and librarian would undertake this solemn duty, acting as both advisors and vigilant guardians over the spiritual and physical well-being of chosen chapter masters. If the chapter master showed the slightest deviance of spirit, chaotic taint, or presented a dire threat to the survival of the entire chapter, he would be executed without remorse. After five millennia of shame, the chapter's redemption may have finally come in the form of their current chapter master, Alexandros the Blind, also born to the famous lineage of Alexandros the Great. Quintus Decius Alexandros is the second Alexandros descended to have risen from the rank of the Sons of Dorne to the position of chapter master. Some say he is the prophesied savior who would finally defeat the evil of Alexandros the Mad and wipe the stain of their chapter's honor clean in the sight of the emperor. Born on Archaea in the year 779 of the 41st millennium, Quintus also came from humble origins. He was inducted into the Sons of Dorne at an early age and quickly rose to prominence within the chapter. 
He served during the later stages of one of the chapter's crusades near the Eye of Terror. Quintus moved rapidly through the ranks, his skills applied to service with both the chapter's famous 4th Battle Company and later the elite 1st Company veterans, the Praetorians. His skills eventually saw him raised to the status of prospective successor for chapter command, despite having only a century of practical experience compared to other Sons of Dorne Battle Brothers. He was universally admired and respected by his fellow Astartes, from his ability as a level-headed and skilled commander. Quintus's presence on the battlefield was said to bolster the morale of those around him, and his tactical skills were said to rival that of his famous ancestor. Upon the death of their former chapter master, Quintus was unanimously elected to undergo the rites of initiation as a prospective chapter master, under the close scrutiny of the senior chaplain and librarian of the chapter. Quintus partook of the poisoned blood of his ancestor and survived the ordeal. Quintus went on to serve the Sons of Dorne as a chapter master for over a century without showing any signs of corruption, putting the well-being of his men before his own. Quintus led many of his strike force from the front lines, often in the thickest of the fighting. The sight of his form in alabaster white artificer power armor smashing through the enemy's ranks served as an inspiration for the warriors that followed him into battle, assuring them of his righteousness and purity. It would not be until the defense of Archaea from the Tyranids in the year 999 of the 41st millennium that the effects of the poisonous blood that he had imbued over a century earlier became readily apparent. Quintus was convalescing upon Archaea within the chapter's apothecarium, recovering from severe wounds incurred during the defense of the Imperium from the 13th Black Crusade, when word reached him that the Tyranid High Fleet was fast approaching. Despite the severity of his wounds, Quintus pushed through the severe pain and hastily prepared his world's defenses in order to hopefully survive the inevitable onslaught. He bent his skills to further buttress the Archaea defenses. Quintus knew that the survival of his world rested on this outcome. When the Tyranid Splinter Fleet arrived on Archaea, it arrived at a world ready for a fight, for the planet's surface possessed a carefully created series of defenses which the Sons of Dorne would man alongside the Archaean Planetary Defense Force. Quintus's plan, should the worst befall his defenders, was to fall back toward the chapter's fortress monastery, located in the planet's towering peaks, and hopefully hold out until reinforcement arrived. The Sons of Dorne's fleet was hopelessly outmatched in orbit, and had to disengage to preserve their numbers, leaving the forces on the ground to fend for themselves. The four companies of space marines on Archaea were dispatched across the globe to various key cities and locations to protect the population. They fought valiantly, but it was a losing battle, and eventually the Astartes had to pull back to their fortress monastery, leaving the Archaean civilians to fend for themselves. This brutal conflict lasted for several months as the Sons of Dorne fought a brilliant but ultimately futile campaign against the vast hordes of the ravenous Tyranid Swarm. All hope for aid was lost, and with only 135 Astartes remaining, the Sons of Dorne knew that they were going to die, but not before they sold their lives dearly. It was near the outskirts of the Sons of Dorne's fortress monastery at the Battle of Ikean Plateau that Quintus and his surviving Astartes made their valiant last stand. Just as all hope was lost, their hearts soared at the sight of their chapter's drop pods and Thunderhawk gunships dropping from the skies with the valiant 4th Company spearheading the assault. The 4th Company slammed into the rear flank of the Tyranid Swarm as Quintus led a valiant charge across the front lines, catching the vile Xenos in a pincer movement. The Sons of Dorne were vastly outnumbered and thought it appeared that they would ultimately fall. Quintus never lost hope in the face of overwhelming odds. He trusted that the Emperor and the spirit of Rogaldorn would protect them leading the assault, the chapter master soon identified the malevolent intelligence that led the usual mindless swarm, a tyrannid hive tyrant. Under the hive tyrant's psychic dominion, the swarm continuously adapted to defeat Quintus's tactics as quickly as he developed them. Determined to break the synapse controlling of the bioengineering bioform, Quintus bravely plunged into the fray, attacking the hive tyrant and his bodyguards of tyrant guard bioforms. Be set on all sides, 
Quintus' superlative swordsmanship fell three of the Tyranid guard, but there was still the Hive Tyrant to deal with. In the midst of the ferocious fighting, Quintus took a score of wounds from the large bone blades of the ravaging Hive Tyrant, laying him down. It was then, when all seemed lost, that Quintus was poised to die at the hands of the Hive Tyrant, that a miracle occurred. A brilliant explosion of light erupted from his body, levitating his form off the ground. The luminescence disappeared as abruptly as it had appeared, to be replaced by a nimbus of unlight that spread across the battlefield. It was dark, yet not. Those who witnessed this miracle still find it almost impossible to explain. As this dark light rolled across the battlefield, the chapter's librarians fell to their knees in agony as the projected aura of psychic blankness washed over them, a powerful aura of psychic nothingness similar to that used by the Kulix assassins. Their psychic connection severed, the Tyranid Swarm quickly descended into anarchy without the dominating will of the Hive Tyrant to guide them. Seeing their chapter master beset, the Sons of Dorne hastened to their fallen lord and quickly dispatched the remaining Tyranid guard. Quintus's honor guard fought against the Hive Tyrant and in a monumental battle hacked the monstrous creature down with the blades of their ceremonial power swords. The Sons of Dorne then destroyed the remainder of the swarms in earnest. After the battle, it was determined by the chapter's senior librarians that Quintus's manifestation of these strange abilities had resulted in him spontaneously becoming a pariah, a psychic blank. Quintus now possessed the innate ability to nullify psychic powers, and if in close quarters to those with psychic abilities, his very existence could drain the strength from them all. It was reported by those that witnessed this event that the aura projected by the chapter master was so powerful that even non-psychic battle brothers doubled over in agony, causing them to retch for blood. Just like their ancestor, Apius before him, Quintus had never shown any signs of possessing the rare pariah gene or any latent psychic abilities. Therefore, it was determined that this ability was caused by the poisoned blood he had immuned a century earlier. It could not be explained why it took so long for this ability to manifest. Some claim that it was the divine intervention of the Emperor, sending Quintus his gift as a way to combat the Great Devourer. The Chapter Masters of the Forge, working in concert with the Chapter's librarians, develop a lampening device to help block the worst of the effects caused by Quintus's powers, which was fitted to the Chapter Master's suit of power armor. The librarian still felt ill at ease when near him, but for those without psychic abilities, the device proved its worth. This enabled the chapter master to turn off the device at will, a useful ability when combatant heretics, demons, or xenos that possess psychic abilities. The librarians claim that Quintus was a fulfillment of the ancient chapter prophecy from thousands of years ago come to fruition. Hailed as their chapter's prophesied savior, the battle brothers within the chapter revertly now refer to the chapter master as Alexandro the Blind, in honor of his miraculous abilities. Where Alexandros the Mad had been excessive and insane, Alexandros the Blind was the exact opposite of his ancestor in every way. With his pariah ability, Quintus would be able to cancel out Apius' greatest advantage, his powerful psychic abilities. Though the two chapter masters have yet to confront one another, Quintus has vowed that before he dies, he will find Apius and destroy him, erasing the stain of the chapter's honor forever. And those were 40 facts on the Sons of Dorne. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I'm going to put a link down in the description below to Mengel's website. He showcases his Sons of Dorne awesome paint job. You guys should really check it out. Uh, and again, this should serve as inspiration for you to create a more badass Space Marine chapter. If you do have a homebrew chapter that you guys would like us to showcase on our um, in one of our videos, just hit us up either on um, Instagram, Facebook, or email us at OneMindSyndicate1 um, at gmail.com, and um, we'll create a video for you guys. But thanks for listening, and I'll talk to you tomorrow. This was Gershwan with One Mind Syndicate signing out. Thank <laughs> you.